techniques, and that's uh, the next section we'll be looking at. So in the uh, adapted version, we have to do some sort of estimation of the channel. And this es estimation of the channel could be explicit or it could be implicit. Explicit means I set out as my objective to measure what is the frequency response of this channel. Okay, so I will um, find, for instance, what are the impulse response coefficients. Or I will measure with a um, signal analyzer what is the frequency response of my uh, channel. And from that I do the inverse Fourier transport to get the impulse response. Um, so this is a, an approach which is good for static channels. So if I don't know the if I don't have signal, uh, sorry, channel knowledge, I can get channel knowledge by a series of measurements, and this would be the technique that I would use. For instance, I could have done that in the case of this example uh, I showed you. Uh, perhaps I went and I measured it, and then I did the inverse Fourier transform, and I and I came up with this series of measurements. Now, the other possibility is that the channel is changing. And it's changing, so I just can't afford to go and take the system to the lab and do a measurement on the frequency response, because I, as soon as I make it, the channel will change, I'd have to do it again. So now I'm going into something that's more like an implicit channel estimate. It's not like I really estimate the channel. It's just I'm going to be estimating the coefficients of the filter. And because I'm estimating the coefficients of the filter directly, they're, well, of course, they're different depending on what the channel frequency response is or the channel impulse response is. And so as I'm finding the filter cap, the uh, tap coefficients, it's kind of like I was estimating the channel and then calculating them. It's just I, I cut out the middleman. I cut out uh, the intermediate step and go directly to just adapting the uh, coefficients. So the filter coefficients can be found, the filter coefficients of the zero forcing or the MMSE can be found by an adaptation. So I'm not actually doing the manipulations I showed you in the example. The zero forcing, I'm not taking that set of coefficients that I estimated and calculating the inverse of the matrix and then uh, applying it. I'm not taking uh, the um, expected value of the coefficients uh, of the system and then developing the coefficients. Instead, what I'm doing is I have an algorithm I run that tries to uh, estimate what the best um, uh, coefficients are to either invert the channel in the case of zero forcing or minimize the mean squared error in the, curse of the case of the MMSC. So to do that, I need to know the data. Okay, I need to know the data and again I come to this idea of using a header with a training sequence in order to do the adaptation. So I talked about that uh, a little bit earlier about what uh, would have to be uh, required for that. And there's two ways of doing this. and one of them is called data aided. That refers to that idea of the header. And then I'm going to show you another extension to that called decision directed. And it's really confusing, the wording, okay? So uh, don't be surprised if you get confused. I get confused too. But we'll try and keep it um, clear. Data aided is when I have a training sequence, when I know with the receiver what the correct bits are. Decision directed is going to be instead when I base it on my decisions. I don't know. I don't know what data was transmitted, but I go through the whole rigmarole of doing good detection and I get what I think is the right bit. And then I just say, well, I'm going to assume it is right. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but I'm going to assume it is and use that in my adaptation. So we can imagine that this is a little less reliable than this one, but there might be reasons why one is better than the other. So we'll be talking about this. Uh, again, these solutions, whether they're uh, fixed or whether they're adaptive, whether it's based on explicit channel estimation or implicit channel estimation, they all fall in the same taxonomy uh, down here for the linear transversal uh, filters. So again, let's look at this idea of data aided. Uh, I exploit a header to look for the adaptive coefficients. So I take the, the known data here, now I know the Ds, and I can uh, take the coefficients of the filter and see, for example, for the zero forcing, how much ISI is there because I know, you know, what the signal was and I can figure out how much ISI there was and try to make it zero. Or I could look at the mean squared error, try to make that zero for the MMSE. 
and like I said, it's sort of like an implicit estimation of the channel. So it's not like uh, I, I send the data so that I could do the estimate. I, I can do the adaptation. I could just take this data and actually estimate the channel from it, but then there would be an extra step. So instead, I just go directly to uh, adapting the coefficients. Now, I said that this is important for channels that change with time, which means that I can't just do this as a one-off. I can't just do it once and then I'm done. I have to do it periodically, which is why I used a framed structure on my data transmission, so that I will take 10% of my frame and use it for the, my training data. And then after I have exceeded a certain amount of time, and this time is dependent on how variable my channel is. If I'm in a wireless channel that's in a um, high-speed train and the, you know, it's moving very, very fast, the channel may change more quickly than if I'm just strolling through town using my cell phone. So depending on the channel, uh, you may need to update more or less often. And so that will be something that is a parameter that can be adjusted for uh, the particular system you're looking at. Now, what happens if the channel is changing a lot? Then I would have to increase uh, or decrease the time of data, and eventually the header will be taking up you know, more space than the data, which would be like really too inefficient, not the way we want to go with a, a system. That's why we can't rely completely on data aided, because this situation with a very fast changing channel would, would make it uh, in, inconvenient or impractical uh, to implement, which is why we go to this idea of decision-directed adaptation. So decision-directed is a way of updating coefficients. It's not like for the way of initiating the coefficients. I use the header when I know the data to initiate my first calculation, what are the coefficients. Now, I start using those right away, the ones I calculated with the known data. But afterwards, as time goes by, I think that these initial estimates are not as good because the channel's starting to change, it's starting to drift to another value. Uh, in this case, what I can do is start using my internal decisions and do a new adaptation or even a continuous adaptation. So I do my initial one, get the first coefficients, and then every now and then I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to use the decisions I have so far and I'm going to tweak those coefficients. And I continue tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. Now, if the channel really drifts very far away from the initial values that were here, well, eventually each tweak is not going to be so perfect. And eventually I'm going to have some errors. Even if it's just from noise, I'm going to get some errors. And those errors means that when I do my decision directed, I'm going to adapt my coefficients in the wrong direction because I gave it the wrong data. And when that starts happening, I start drifting farther away from what is the true best equalization technique. So eventually, of course, this decision directed is not enough and I have to go back and make a header. But at least with the decision directed, I can space out the uh, training sequences so that they don't eat into the efficiency of my data transmission. But of course, Maybe the channel is dynamic and I didn't do a good job and I let it go too long. I was trying to get greedy, trying not to keep the, the overhead low. And so it's possible with this idea of decision directed to really be vulnerable to total loss of communications uh, outage. Uh, if I drift away faster than I thought because my decisions uh, become start spiraling, I make a few decisions and then those decisions start pushing my filter so far away that, that um, you know, it's not even that I was staying with the ones that weren't great, but I'm moving away and in the wrong direction. Uh, so it is vulnerable to, to outage, but very uh, important for efficiency. So this would be the typical structure of a decision-directed adaptation. So I have my equalizer here, and I have some error function that I'm using to adapt. So I have this arrow means that I'm adapting the coefficients of my equalizer. And I go through the decision process. So this is the output of my equalizer. So this has been cleaned up. This is the receive signal. Now I do DSP, I clean it up, and then I go and I make my decision. So this decision, I'm going to, when this I'm in the decision directed part, so this is up here, I'm going to use that to form the error signal. So remember, my error signal is the output of the filter minus the true data. That's my error. And when I'm in here, 
in the training mode, when this switch is down, that means in the training mode, this is known true data. But what happens when I switch this the other way is instead of being the true data, this becomes z of n minus the, well, decision on z of n. So z and n, I put it in my, um, I put it in my threshold or whatever uh, algorithm I'm using for detection, and whatever decision in that is, I assume that it's true, and I put this into uh, decision. And this would be a decision directed. And of course, this would be data aided. So although the structure looks the same, depending on what the switch setting is, I'm in one of these other sections. So when I have the uh, switch here is in the lower position, uh, that means I'm using the header. That's, I'm in that part of the frame. And when this switch is instead in the upper position, that means I'm in the data section of the frame. 